Hi, I'm Dr. Younger. I'm director of the Neuroinflammation Pain and Fatigue Lab, and today I'm going to talk about how a painful plant can help with chronic pain. First, here are the disclosures for this video. And what we're talking about is stinging nettle, or urtica dioica. And we're talking about how this leaf may help with chronic pain, kind of like fibromyalgia all over body pain. This is following last week's talk where I discussed how green light may help with chronic widespread body pain. And now we're going to talk about a green plant and how it may help with chronic pain. So here's the leaf we're talking about, the stinging nettle leaf. This is a nice green, natural leaf. Looks very nice until you zoom up and then you see why it's called stinging nettle. It's because of these trichomes that basically act as needles that can inject acids into your skin. You can see at the base this kind of reservoir of acids and other compounds that cause very intense stinging if you brush against this plant in the wild. Now the UK viewers know, the United Kingdom viewers know all about this plant. My introduction to stinging nettle was when I was in Wales and walking along the side of the road with shorts on instead of pants. And I was in the, the weeds because of the cars on the road and I brushed up against one of these plants. I had no idea what it was. I just got this intense burning all over my leg and these welts started to form. And I didn't know what it was. I thought it was some kind of assassin ant that was running up and biting and then running away real quick because I was looking, I couldn't find anything. Anyway, I found out pretty quickly that it was due to the stinging nettle that was growing everywhere. And so when you live around them, you learn very quickly what they look like and what they do, and you learn to um, avoid those. Uh, that's not what this talk is about. The reason I'm interested in stinging nettle now is because it has shown promise in reducing pro-inflammatory cytokines in the blood and throughout the body. Things like interleukin-1 beta and tumor necrosis factor alpha. These are cytokines that if they're elevated, they can cause um, pain and fatigue and, and other issues. And since there is limited evidence that stinging nettle, when consumed, can reduce these pro-inflammatory chemicals, I thought it may be very helpful for fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue syndrome and other conditions. I've never seen any direct evidence that stinging nettle can reduce microglia uh, hyperactivity in the brain. I don't think it's ever been studied, but because it's reducing these chemicals that I know aggravate microglia, I thought it's possible. So uh, I thought it was worth testing. So here's the paper that I'm discussing. This is my own uh, research. This is a placebo-controlled, pseudo-randomized crossover trial of botanical agents for Gulf War illness. And we looked at reishi, mushroom, stinging nettle, and epimedium. And we're only going to talk about the stinging nettle in this talk. I'll address the other compounds and whether or not they're worth trying in, a, in different talks. Now, this was a very small study. So only 10 men with Gulf War illness tested the stinging nettle. So we can only call this a pilot study. Now, Gulf War illness is suspected to be due to exposures that people had, that the soldiers had in the Persian Gulf War in 1991. Um, it could have been vaccines. It could have been diesel particles in the air. There were munition depots that were blown up. They were exposed to all kinds of different things. We don't know exactly which one caused the Gulf War illness. It was probably a combination of just all these immune insults that overwhelmed the immune system and made it hyperactive. Now, I do think there are overlaps between Gulf War illness and fibromyalgia and myalgic encephalomyelitis, chronic fatigue syndrome, and a few other conditions but I can't say that they're exactly the same. So I'm gonna be talking about data from Gulf War illness that doesn't necessarily mean that it would do the same thing in the other conditions. I suspect it might, but we don't know until we test it specifically in those other conditions as well. So that's just a caveat. Now this paper is open access. I'm gonna put a link in the description of this video. Uh, I make almost all of my papers open access, even though it's expensive to do that. It means that anyone, no matter where you're at in the world, you can access the paper and read all the details for yourself if you're interested. So anyway, the quick story is in this study, when the individuals were in the stinging nettle phase of the study, they had a baseline phase of 
30 days and they were reporting their symptoms daily. Then they had um, placebo for 30 days. Then they had low dose stinging nettle, which was about around 450 milligrams per day. And then they had high dose stinging nettle for 30 days. And that was at around uh, 1,300 milligrams a day. So they had low and high dose. So baseline, placebo, low dose, high dose. Each of those were 30 days. And they rated their, their symptoms, cognitive, pain, fatigue, every day for that entire period. So here are the results. Uh, on the left of the Rishi, on the very right is the epimedium. And we're not going to look at those. We're only focusing on this stinging nettle, which is in the green box here in this talk. Now, this is what we're looking at here is overall Gulf War illness severity. And so this is all the symptoms wrapped together, all the pain, fatigue, cognitive stuff, everything. It's not separating out different specific symptoms. I'll look at that in a second or show you that in a second. So this is overall symptom severity. And again, if you're not familiar with Gulf War illness, it, it presents fairly similarly to fibromyalgia. I think that's the closest in terms of the collection of symptoms that we see here. Now, this group did not have really severe Gulf War illness because you can see the baseline, which is this black bar, uh, is just under 30. And so that's fairly um, mild Gulf War illness. Now, I don't know if we gathered a group of very highly affected individuals would stinging nettle work better or worse? We don't know. We would have to run that to see. But just want to note that this group is relatively well off uh, with this condition. So what we see here is when they took the uh, placebo, their symptoms dropped. And this is the expectancy effect, which we expect to see in any clinical trial. Then when they took low-dose stinging nettle, their symptoms dropped even more. So this would be a pharmacologic effect of the stinging nettle. And then when they took high dose stinging nettle, their symptoms dropped even more. And so the total reduction from baseline to high dose is about 50% reduction, which is uh, quite nice. Now, this is a standard dose response where the symptoms go down, down, down with higher dosages. And this is what we generally like to see. It gives us confidence that this is really a a drug-related effect and not just expectancy. Um, so this is pretty interesting. Now, 10 people, again, that doesn't tell us much of anything. We cannot recommend a medication to anyone, botanical or not, based on 10 people. Now, we are running a larger trial, uh, and at least 100 people will be taking it in the trial I'm running right now. So we will have much better information in the next year or so. And then I can make more confident um, recommendations on using that. Now, I did look at pain and fatigue specifically. The pain was reduced by about 40% and the fatigue was reduced by about 17%. Now, this group didn't have a lot of fatigue. So I don't know how well stinging nettle would work in a primarily fatigued group. I have no idea. What I can say in this group the stinging nettle worked better for chronic pain than it did fatigue. And so that's something to um, note. And that actually agrees with the uh, scientific literature. I don't see anything or, or much of anything in the published studies going back, say, 20 years that mention stinging nettle really helping fatigue. So that doesn't seem to be one of the primary uses of stinging nettle. So uh, let me tell you what we used. This is stinging nettle leaf capsules that we used. Uh, and I'll show you, as there's not much to look at. It's just a very small capsule, which is the dried leaf material packed into the gel cap. There are other uses of stinging nettle. The old use of it is um, using the actual barbs, actual the actual leaf, and rubbing it on areas of the skin that need help. And... Um, you know, I can't vouch for that because I don't do research on using the raw leaf, but I know it's been used in that way. Now, typically it's used to treat um, pain with joints when you're using the whole leaf. And so it'll be actually be rubbed on the joints where there's pain. And sometimes that'll be the base of the thumb. And it has shown some success being used that way. Although, again, I have not done those studies myself. Uh, so the small joints of the fingers, maybe the knees. And it looks like it can help with that. 
Now, of course, there'll be some stinging associated with that. And so it, it reminds me of the old um, bee stings for rheumatoid arthritis in the hands, where they'll actually use literal bee stings to reduce the inflammation in uh, the joints. And that's, that's a real thing. It's just you don't see it that much because it's kind of hard, impractical to do. Now, there's also nettle cream. And nettle cream would probably burn a little bit, but kind of in a good way because it would cover up that underlying kind of achy pain that you have in the muscles and in the joints. So that's kind of like capsaicin cream. So there's nettle cream, there's teas, and then of course there's the, the capsules. Now with the capsules, the stinging is a non-issue. So I think people wonder about that, like will the capsules sting or if, I, if it breaks open in my mouth and it gets in my mouth, will it sting? And the answer is no, it, it can't sting you. Not only are the needle-like trichomes destroyed in the process, but more importantly, the acids that cause the burning are completely neutralized by this process. So there's no way that you can get a sting from taking sting nettle in this form. It's just not going to happen. Now, I do want to note that this is, again, this is nettle leaf. There are other products that will involve nettle root. And my understanding, I've not done research on nettle root. My understanding is that it, the nettle root is used more for urinary issues. And again, I don't know much about that. I have, I have not done anything with the root, but I do know that there are products and applications for the nettle root. And I'm sure there's products that combine the two, but what I've used is only the leaf part of the nettle plant. Now, what I've been most interested in with the nettle leaf is its effects on C-reactive protein. There's been multiple studies showing that if someone takes nettle leaf for a few weeks, their C-reactive protein will be decreased. And this has been shown in type 2 diabetes patients and individuals with enlarged prostate glands, a few other conditions. And I'm seeing it in our Gulf Orionis patients as well. So it seems like nettle reduces C-reactive protein. And that means it may be a very good option for people who have chronic pain and have slightly or moderately elevated C-reactive protein. And if you watch my videos for a while, you'll know that I talk a lot about C-reactive protein. It's one of the best markers of overall systemic body inflammation. And I think it's a very important metric because just a small increase of your CRP uh, indicates if it's, if it's been happening for a long time, it indicates this kind of inflammatory damage happening to your vascular system all the time. And this will increase your chance of having um, heart attacks and strokes and numerous other issues. And so you really, really want to get your CRP down as low as you can. You, you want it at zero if you can, but at least if you can get it below three milligrams per deciliter, so somewhere between zero, zero and three, that improves the issue. And we're seeing a lot of people with chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia coming in with values 8, 9, 10, and that is just way too high. And so, you know, I, I hope that the medical system will take this kind of chronic systemic inflammation more seriously and try to find ways to reduce C-reactive protein and get that to as close to zero as possible. And it is looking like stinging nettle may be uh, one potential tool in helping to achieve that. So can I recommend stinging nettle for your chronic pain? Uh, the short answer is no, I can't right now. And the only reason is because there's not enough studies and the studies are not large enough. I'm trying to work on that right now. So that answer may change in the next year, but not yet. Um, I research, I mean, we just need more information and that's why I'm doing the clinical trials that I'm running. Uh, there doesn't seem to be a lot of side effects to note. Uh, I have not noticed any in my participants and there's not much reported. I would say with any botanical, do check with your physician, even though the treatment may be a botanical, if you're taking medications, the botanical could interact in a negative way with your medications. Um, there are some significant botanical medication interactions that you want to avoid. And I'm not going to go through the list of stinging nettle, but before you take something like this, any botanical, um, check with your physician and run a botanical drug interaction checker as well, which you can find online. But check with your doctor and make sure there's no 
conflict with what you're taking. The only other co uh, caveat is I popped online on Amazon to look at what people were selling right now, what was popular with stinging nettle. There's a lot now. So there's, it's been, it's become very popular. And one concerning thing I noticed is there's, I, I'm seeing a number of products that are fortified, like 10X strength or 20X strength. And that is a bit troubling to me because those extremely high concentrations have not been tested scientifically. And so I just want to warn you that if you take something, it's like 10X or 20X and equivalent of 9,000 milligrams, um, it may work. We just don't know. We've never tested these hyper um, isolated fortified products. And so just be aware that if you're doing that, you're way outside of the realm of science and you're basically conducting scientific experiments on yourself at that point. And that can work out well and it could work out poorly. Uh, you just don't know. So watch out for those uh, really, really high dosage formulations. I just, there hasn't been any studies to suggest that high dosage is needed. Now, I've never seen studies to suggest that they're harmful, so they may be fine, but the bottom line is we just don't know. And I would rather that be tested in a controlled, safe environment than you having to test that yourself. But that's my caveat with that. So check out the paper if you're interested in learning more. If you want to find out what brand of stinging nettle I used in this project, you can find that in the paper. I don't like to mention uh, brand names in videos, so I do that as little as possible. But you can find that, I think it's on page three under the section botanicals. You can see exactly where we got the stinging nettle. It's pretty easy to find. And you can also get the information on the dosages that we used as well. I'm not a naturopath, and so I can't tell you that what I used in the study was the best stinging nettle, but it met all the criteria that I needed it to meet to be a good clinical trial product. But there may be other products that are even better. That's possible. So this is just another thing to consider so you can look into it. I'm going to put a couple of links to other videos that are related. I'm going to put a link to the curcumin video that I did quite a while ago. And I'm also going to put a link to inflammatory tests in case you're, you're interested in hearing more about uh, C-reactive protein. So that's it for now. I hope you have a good week and you're able to come back next week and I will give another talk then. So see you soon. Thanks.